Well, hi friends, this is Pastor Dave, and I'm here with another story for you today. It's a story that reminds me about when I was a boy growing up, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Did you ever go to the museum and see the big dinosaur bones? In my town, Pittsburgh, there are lots and lots of those bones in the museum. The book that I have for today, the story is called Barnum's Bones. And it tells us the true story of a man whose name was Barnum Brown and how he found some bones that changed the way we understand history. Barnum's Bones was written by someone whose name is Tracy Fern. And the pictures were drawn by a man named Boris Kulikov. Let's listen for the story of Barnum's Bones. How Barnum Brown discovered the most famous dinosaur in the world. Hmm. <laughs> Something exciting happened in Carbondale, Kansas on February 12, 1873. The Brown family had a baby boy. It was even more exciting than the circus, and the Browns adored the circus. In fact, the Browns loved the circus so much they named their baby Barnum, after the most famous circus owner in America, P.T. Barnum. They hoped that Barnum's important sounding and unusual name would inspire him to, be, to do important, unusual things. Well, Barnum started doing something unusual right from the start. As soon as Barnum could toddle, he followed along behind his paw's plow, picking up ancient corals and clams and snails and scallops that it unearthed. Barnum filled boxes with his fossil collection. He filled his dresser with his collection. He filled his entire bedroom with his collection. When he filled the front parlor, his mama, who never considered that the important, unusual things she had dreamed for her son would involve fossil shellfish in the parlor. She made him move his treasures out to the laundry house. Barnum spent years studying his collection, trying to imagine what the world must have been like millions of years ago when his family's high, dry farm was at the bottom of a shallow, swirling sea. And then one day, he read about fo dinosaur fossils that had been unearthed in the, we in the West. Brontosaurus and Triceratops and Stegosaurus and more. Barnum longed to find some bones for himself, especially bones from species that no one had ever found before. Barnum got his chance when he took a course in paleontology at the University of Kansas, and he was such a good student that his professor invited him to spend the summers of 1894 and 1895 on fossil hunts in South Dakota and Wyoming. Each morning, Barnum set out at sunrise. He hiked over mountains, across creek beds, down precipices, through streams, and around rattlesnake nests. Most folks would think this was torture. Barnum thought it was wonderful. Barnum, who was an unusually nice dresser, sometimes went prospecting in a fur coat and a suit and tie, buffed black boots, and a bowler hat. No matter how he was dressed, Barnum found bones. He didn't discover any new species, but he and the rest of the Wyoming expedition collected more than 1,400 pounds of bones including a six-foot-long, four-and-a-half-foot-wide, perfect Triceratops skull. Henry Fairfield Osborne, a professor at Columbia University and an administrator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, heard about Barnum's talent for bone hunting from Barnum's professor at the University of Kansas. Now, Professor Osborne wanted the museum to have the best dinosaur collection in the world. So far, the museum had none. <laughs> no bones at all. 
Professor Osborne hired Barnum to work on fossil hunts for the museum. Most people called the slightly terrifying Professor Osborne, Sir. But Barnum called him, My dear professor, because he loved bones as much as Barnum did. My dear professor sent Barnum back to Wyoming in 1897 to hunt fossils. Once again, Barnum didn't discover any new species, but he did unearth the museum's first important dinosaurs. Two enormous long-necked sauropods, a Diplodocus longus and an Apatosaurus. Then, in December 1898, my dear professor sent Barnum on a collecting trip to Patagonia in South America. Barnum found four and a half tons of mammal fossils, despite being shipwrecked and nearly eaten by a mountain lion. More than a year later, Barnum returned to New York City with a boatload full of bones. He must be able to smell fossils, my dear professor said. Barnum had more than just a good nose. He pored over maps and geology books. He chatted with local people. He studied the shape and color and texture of the rock layers, and his passion for fossils led him to discover more and more bones. But he still dreamed of discovering something new. One morning in 1902, Barnum's friend William Hornaday, the director of the New York Zoological Park, gave Barnum an interesting rock that he had found on a hunting trip in the Badlands near Hell Creek, Montana. Barnum's nose started twitching. That rock wasn't any rock. It was the horn of a triceratops. <laughs> Do you see how that fits in there, right there? In June 1902, Barnum and a small crew headed by train and then by horses to the Badlands. Barnum found lots of fossils, but they were all damaged or familiar. Back in New York City, my dear professor was getting cranky. His rivals at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh had made an exciting find. Many bones from a new species of dinosaur, a Diplodocus carnegie. It was named after Andrew Carnegie, a businessman and founder of the museum. Oh, he looks pretty proud of himself, doesn't he? One day, Barnum spotted some boulders that had tumbled down a steep cliff. He scrambled off his horse and up the cliff. He found a bone the color of milky coffee st sticking out of the hillside. Barnum swooshed away a loose sand with a soft brush. Then he started digging in around the bone with his pick. The deeper he dug, the more bone he found. Barnum dug until night fell. The next morning, he returned with his crew, and they dug until they hit a layer of flinty blue sandstone nearly as hard as steel. Barnum carefully blasted off layers of rock with dynamite. Then the quarry filled with metallic pings of hammers, the scraping of awls against bone, and a soft whisper of brushes. Finally, Barnum began to see the outline of a massive, curving bone, a dinosaur's pelvis. Then he uncovered a few of the creature's backbones, a thigh bone, an arm bone, and other fragments, and... Barnum had never seen anything like these bones before. By early October, the season was over. Soon, snow would cover the Badlands. Barnum had to get his fragile bones safely to the museum. He painted shellac on the exposed parts of the bones. Covered the shellac with a thin layer of newspaper, slathered on layers of plaster-soaked burlap strips to form a hard protective cast around the fossils. Barnum hitched four horses to a wagon and slowly pulled the two-ton pelvis and other bones 130 miles back to the trains. Along the way, Barnum couldn't resist collecting some interesting leaves and what he thought might be four ancient crocodile skeletons, too. For the next few seasons, 
Barnum was busy on other fossil expeditions, but he and his crew returned to Hell Creek in June 1905 to remove more bones. During the winter months, they worked in the museum's laboratory trying to fit bone fragments together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. My dear professor named the new dinosaur species Tyrannosaurus rex, the king of kings, a fighting machine. Barnum called it his favorite child. Barnum and my dear professor studied the T-Rex bone fragments and even displayed a portion of the skeleton in the museum. But many of the pieces of the T-Rex puzzle were missing, including a complete head. Barnum longed to know more about his new dinosaur. What did it look like? What did it eat? How did it walk? So, in 1908, Barnum and a few men went to an area of the Badlands he had never searched before. Barnum looked for weeks and collected nothing but sunburn and mosquito bites. On July 1st, Barnum and his horse Brownie were clip-clopping along Big Dry Creek after another long, hot, fruitless day of prospecting. Barnum had already combed the area several times. He knew he should start looking somewhere else, but somehow he smelled fossils. He scanned the buttes one last time, and suddenly Barnum saw an unusual rock glinting in the sun. Barnum and Brownie clambered up the butte for a closer look. Yes, just as Barnum had hoped, the unusual rock was the smooth, rounded end of a bone. But what exactly was it? The next day, Barnum and his crew dug a six-foot trench around the bone, and they found bones everywhere. But the bones were too jumbled and too deeply embedded in the sandstone to identify. Barnum scraped and plowed and dug and blasted for weeks, and still he didn't know what he had found. To make matters worse, he couldn't find any additional men to help make the digging or the cooking go faster. Luckily, Barnum was an unusually good cook. Slowly, Barnum uncovered enough bones to identify his find. It was the treasure he had dreamed of. A perfect, four-foot-long T-Rex skull, studded with serrated six-inch-long teeth. In fact, the whole skeleton was nearly perfect with only the leg bones missing. Together with his first find, he finally had enough bones to piece together the entire animal. Barnum, who was an unusually good dancer, celebrated his find at a nearby ranch by doing the tango and the two-step until midnight. My dear professor was so excited that he decided to come to Montana to visit the T-Rex himself. It took Barnum until October of 1908 to dig up all the bones and haul them by horse and wagon to the nearest train, and then it took seven more years to clean and mount the skeleton. At last, Barnum could see what he had dreamed about for so long, the complete skeleton of an entirely new dinosaur species, and a whopping big one, too. Barnum's new flesh-eating dinosaur was 47 feet long, with huge feet and sharp claws. T-Rex quickly became the most famous dinosaur in the world. Millions of visitors came to see it. Hundreds of scientists came to study it. Look at the people. They all look very impressed. Barnum went on to collect bones all over the world. He hunted by raft in Canada, by elephant in India, by airplane in the United States, and by diving in Cuba. Barnum collected more dinosaur bones than anyone on Earth, but T-Rex was still his favorite child. Just as his family had wanted, Barnum did something important and unusual. He discovered a sleeping dinosaur and brought it back to life. 
68 million years after its extinction, T. rex lives on in Barnum's bones. Well, that's the story of Barnum's bones.